In this PowerPoint, we're going to look at valence bond theory, which brings together Lewis theory, Vesper theory on molecular shape, and the quantum mechanical model of the atom. In particular, it examines the question, what happens to those S, P, D, and F electron orbitals in atoms when covalent bonds form? One of the first components of valence bond theory is that a covalent bond forms when two half-filled electron orbitals from separate bonding atoms overlap to share electrons. On their own, these half-filled orbitals each contain only one electron. When they overlap, though, the unpaired electrons make a bonding pair shared by both atoms. We can see this for the formation of a hydrogen molecule. Each individual hydrogen atom has one electron in the 1s orbital. And when a single covalent bond forms between these two atoms, the 1s orbitals overlap and the unpaired electrons form a bonding pair that's shared by both hydrogen atoms. You can also see this over orbital overlap with other orbital shapes. For example, when a hydrogen and a chlorine atom bond, the unpaired valence electron for chlorine is actually in one of its p orbitals. The 1s from hydrogen then overlaps with this p orbital to form a single bond between hydrogen and chlorine. You can also have two p orbitals overlap, as in the formation of a fluorine molecule. Like chlorine, fluorine has seven valence electrons, and these valence electrons fill the s and two of the p orbitals at the second energy level. That leaves each fluorine atom with the last unpaired valence electron in, the, in one of the two p orbitals. When two fluorine atoms bond, it's these two p orbitals on each atom that overlap, forming a single bond. According to valence bond theory, there are two ways that electron orbitals can overlap to form a bond. All of the examples we've looked at so far are called sigma bonds. And this is the Greek letter for sigma. So these types of bonds involve what we call a head-on overlap between the orbitals, so that the electron density is actually found between the nuclei of the two bonding atoms. The second type of bonding arrangement is called a pi bond. And this is a side-by-side -side overlap between two parallel orbitals, like the two p orbitals that are depicted here. The electron density can be found on either side of the two bonding nuclei, but not directly in between. There's actually a node or a region of no electron density between the two atomic nuclei. So sigma bonds form more frequently. We'll discuss when each type of bond occurs, but first we need to look at one more major component of valence bond theory. The last important piece of valence bond theory is orbital hybridization. The examples on the previous two slides were of two atom molecules. In those cases, the original atomic S, P, D, and F orbitals of the bonding atoms overlap to form bonds. But when a molecule forms with three or more atoms involved, then the s, p, d, and f orbitals on the central atom actually combine to form a completely new set of hybrid orbitals with different shapes. Let's look at the methane molecule as an example of this. So methane is the simplest hydrocarbon molecule. It is a central carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms attached to it. Now, if we were to look at the valence electrons of carbon and each hydrogen separately, we'd find that the four valence electrons on carbon are split between the s and the p orbitals at the second energy level. The first two valence electrons fill the 2s orbital. The second two go into two separate 2p orbitals. 
And so we actually find that for the carbon atom, we only have two unpaired valence electrons in those atomic orbitals. Hydrogen, of course, has its one unpaired electron in the 1s orbital. Now, the two unpaired electrons in the p orbitals of carbon suggest that carbon will only be able to overlap those two orbitals. So carbon should only be able to form two bonds. Furthermore, those two bonds should be 90 degrees apart, since the p orbitals are 90 degrees apart. But we know that this is not the case. Carbon, when it bonds, can form up to four bonds. And methane is CH4, with four hydrogens bound to a central carbon atom, each 109.5 degrees apart from each other. In order for four bonds to form around carbon, we need four orbitals, each with an unpaired electron. And those four orbitals have to be arranged at 109.5 degrees apart from each other, since that's the observed geometry associated with four bonds around a central atom. So this is where hybridization comes into play. During hybridization, the valence S and P orbitals of the carbon add together to form four new hybrid orbitals that are all equal in terms of energy. They're a little bit more energy than the S and a little bit less than the P. But because they're all equal, the electrons actually can rearrange themselves and spread out one to an orbital. And now we have four unpaired electrons in equivalent orbitals that can each form a bond. And since these hybrid orbitals are the result of combining one S and three separate P orbitals together, the new hybrid orbitals are named as sp3. When the orbitals hybridize, the wave functions of the original atomic orbitals add together to produce new wave functions with different shapes. So this is the wave shape that the mathematical combination of 1s and 3p waves would take. So each of these four sp3 orbitals would be an uneven dumbbell shape with one large lobe and one small lobe. And these four hybrid orbitals then can arrange themselves around the nucleus of the carbon atom as shown here at 109.5 degrees apart from each other. So here's how methane looks with those sp3 hybridized orbitals. Hydrogen does remain unhybridized. It's only the central atoms in the molecule that form hybrid orbitals. So the four unpaired electrons in the carbon hybrid sp3 orbitals are now available to form four single bonds by overlapping with the unpaired electrons in each of the hydrogen atoms. And the resulting bond angle from these hybrid orbitals matches that predicted by Vesper theory and the actual molecule of methane based on experimental measurements. So here are a few things to remember about hybrid orbitals. First, they only exist in covalently bonded atoms, not isolated atoms. Hybrid orbitals are formed from combining atomic orbitals. They have different shapes and energies than the original atomic orbitals. And all orbitals in a set of hybrid orbitals are equivalent in terms of shape and energy. And finally, the number of hybrid orbitals formed on a central atom depends on the electron geometry for the molecule predicted by Vesper theory. 
So each of these different electron geometries that we've talked about from Vesper theory actually represents a different hybridization scheme. Let's start with the linear geometry. We know that this forms when there are two electron groups coming off of a central atom. So two electron groups implies two hybrid orbitals being formed. And those hybrid orbitals result from the combination of two atomic orbitals. An s orbital as well as one of the orbitals from the p sublevel. We call the hybrid orbitals that form for linear molecules sp orbitals to represent the two atomic orbitals that were added together. Trigonal planar geometry has three electron groups. So that implies three hybrid orbitals. And those three hybrid orbitals come from adding together three atomic orbitals, the s and two of the p orbitals in the valence shell of the central atom. So we call these hybrid orbitals for trigonal planar geometry sp2 to indicate the different atomic orbitals that were added together to get the hybridization scheme. So the tetrahedral geometry we actually have already discussed. That's four equivalent orbitals, and that implies four hybrid orbitals that are formed from adding together uh, four different atomic orbitals. Those are the s and all three of the p orbitals in the valence shell. And so we call these hybrid orbitals sp3 for the tetrahedral geometry. Now, for trigonal, bipyramidal, and octahedral geometries, we know that these can't occur unless the central atom is in the third period or higher. And this is because in the third energy level, we have the first occurrence of the d atomic orbitals. And when these more rare geometries occur, it's because those central atoms have pulled in d orbitals to increase the number of hybrid orbitals that they can form. So the five electron groups in the trigonal bipyramidal electron geometry have to reflect five hybrid orbitals. And those form from the addition of 1s, all three of the p orbitals, and one of the d subshell orbitals. To reflect this, the name of the hybrid orbital includes all of those, sp3d. When we look at the octahedral geometry, we have six equivalent electron groups that indicate six hybrid orbitals. And that has to be formed from the hybridization of six atomic orbitals. So those include 1s, all three of the p orbitals, and two of the d orbitals in the valence shell. So that those hybrid orbitals for octahedral geometry are named sp3d2. So let's look at some of these hybrid orbitals in a little more depth. So let's start with the linear geometry and sp hybridization. And beryllium fluoride is a good example of a linear geometry molecule. It's one of our exceptions to the octet rule. Beryllium is willing to accept less than eight valence electrons. It has a relatively low electronegativity compared to fluorine. Not low enough to lose its electrons to fluorine completely, but low enough that it can't pull any of fluorine's lone pair electrons towards itself to share in double bonds. As a result, it forms two single bonds. And as we know, the two electron groups represented by each of these bonds results in a linear geometry with a 180 degree bond angle. Now let's look at the hybridization of the beryllium orbitals. So on the left, we have the original atomic orbital configuration. 
Beryllium is in column two of the periodic table. That means it has two valence electrons, and they're found in the 2s atomic orbital. During hybridization, this s orbital and one of the p orbitals in the second energy level combine to form two equivalent sp hybrid orbitals. They're lower in energy than the original p orbitals, but higher than the original s. So the two valence electrons in beryllium spread out, one to an orbital in those sp orbitals, and they're now available for bonding. The re remaining two p orbitals are still there. They don't disappear. In this case, they're empty, and they just don't influence bonding. Now, that's not always the case, and I'll show you another example later in the PowerPoint where the unhybridized p orbitals do participate in bonding. But first, let's finish looking at the relationship between electron geometry and hybridization for some of the other hybridization schemes. Next, let's look at the trigonal planar geometry. Boron is another exception to the octet rule. It'll accept six valence electrons, as we see when it forms boron trihydride. The three single bonds it forms with hydrogen are each 120 degrees apart. So boron is in column 13 of the periodic table, and that means it brings three valence electrons to the molecule. And on the left, we have the original atomic uh, orbitals for those three valence electrons. Two of them are in the 2s orbital and one is in one of the 2p orbitals. So when the boron orbitals hybridize in order to bond, that original s and two of those p orbitals combine together. And when they do so, they form three equivalent sp2 hybrid orbitals that are a little bit less in energy than the original 2p and a little bit more than the 2s. The three valence electrons spread out into those equivalent orbitals, one to an orbital. And now they're available to form single bonds with hydrogen. We see the same pattern for trigonal, bipyramidal, and octahedral geometry. So this shows the hybridization for phosphorus pentachloride, which has five single bonds, one between each chlorine atom in green and the central phosphorus atom in orange. So phosphorus can form five bonds because it's in the third row of the periodic table. And even though it doesn't have electrons in the 3D orbital originally, it can add them together with the S and P orbitals of the third energy level to form five equivalent sp3d orbitals. The remaining d orbitals remain unhybridized and in this case empty. Sulfur hexafluoride is an example of an octahedral electron geometry. So sulfur has six valence electrons. And in order to form six bonds, each of those valence electrons must be unpaired in a hybrid orbital. So those six hybrid orbitals have to come from adding two d orbitals in with the s and p orbitals in its valence shell. It forms sp3 d2. The remaining three d orbitals are unhybridized and empty in this case. So what happens when those unhybridized orbitals left on the central atom are not empty? 
Let's look at an example with ethene. Ethene has the formula C2H4. And drawing the Lewis structure gives us a double bond between the two central carbon atoms and two single bonds with hydrogen off of each carbon. And if we look at the number of electron groups on each carbon, we have three. One for each of the single bonds with hydrogen. And the third electron group is actually associated with the double bond shared between the two carbons. So three electron groups means a trigonal planar geometry. And that means 120 degree bond angles around each carbon atom. Now carbon, as we know, has four valence electrons. And in the formation of this molecule, in order to get a trigonal planar geometry, we only have three hybrid orbitals form. So those four valence electrons actually spread themselves out so that three of them go into the hybrid orbitals and the last valence electron for carbon actually remains in an unhybridized p orbital. So the hybrid orbitals then form sigma bonds with head-on overlap. Two of them on each carbon atom bond with the hydrogen atoms. The third hybrid orbital forms the first bond in the double bond between the two carbon atoms. The electrons in the unhybridized p orbital on each carbon atom then form a pi bond with side by side overlap. And this is the second bond in the double bond between the two carbon atoms. So triple bonds form when two unhybridized orbitals overlap side by side. Ethine is a great example of this. When drawing its Lewis structure, you get one hydrogen bound to each carbon and a triple bond forming between the two carbon atoms. And each carbon can be considered a central atom, so we count their electron groups separately. There are two groups on each, the one single bond with hydrogen and the triple bond with the other carbon. So two electron groups indicates a linear geometry and sp hybridization. And when this molecule forms, the four valence electrons associated with carbon separate into the two sp hybrid orbitals and two unhybridized p orbitals. All are unpaired, so all are available for bonding. So the hybrid orbitals in ethyne form sigma bonds by overlapping head-on with the hydrogen atoms as well as with the other carbon atom. And this overlap between the two hybrid orbitals on the carbon atoms is the first bond in the triple bond. The second and third bond in that triple bond formed from the side-by-side -side overlap between the two unhybridized p orbitals. So these are pi bonds. So this leads us to a few more things to remember about hybrid orbitals and valence bond theory. First, hybrid orbitals always overlap head-on to form sigma bonds. Meanwhile, unhybridized orbit orbitals always overlap side by side to form pi bonds. And all single bonds are always sigma bonds. But double and triple bonds actually consist of both sigma and pi bonds. The first bond is always a head-on overlap between hybrid orbitals, so it's always a sigma bond. The second and third bond 
is a side-by-side -side overlap with unhybridized orbitals. So those are pi bonds. The last thing to remember we haven't looked at yet as an example. It's that lone pairs on the central atom always go into hybrid orbitals. So let's look at the water molecule with hybrid orbitals drawn to illustrate this last example. Here's the Lewis structure for water. On that central oxygen atom, we have four electron groups. Two of them are single bonds with hydrogen, and two groups are lone pairs of electrons on that central oxygen atom. So two single bonds, two lone pairs, but that's still four electron groups in total. And that's a tetrahedral geometry that's associated with sp3 hybridization. Now in oxygen, we have six valence electrons. And in the unhybridized atom, those valence electrons spread themselves out between the 2s and the 2p orbitals. To form a tetrahedral geometry, all four of these atomic orbitals have to combine to form equivalent sp3 orbitals. And the electrons arrange themselves in those equivalent hybrid orbitals so that two pairs of electrons are found in two of the orbitals and the remaining two contained unpaired electrons. And it's the unpaired electrons in those two remaining hybrid orbitals that form the single bonds with hydrogen. But the lone pairs are still in hybrid orbitals and they contribute to the overall electron geometry of that molecule. So that water does take on a bent shape with a bond angle that's approximately 109.5 degrees. It's a little bit less. That's not because the lone pairs aren't in hybrid orbitals though. They are definitely in hybrid orbitals. It's just that lone pairs occupy a little bit more space than bonding pairs. They repulse a little bit more strongly and they push those bonding pairs of electrons just a little bit closer together. So the bond angle is 104.5. So if you can predict electron geometry, you should be able to predict orbital hybridization too. Let's look at a few examples. You always start with the Lewis structure of the molecule. And if it's not drawn for you, you'll have to draw it. I've provided the structure for these examples though. And their first step is to always identify the central atom and count the number of electron groups on it, just as you would for determining bond angle and electron geometry. And then you can assign the hybridization scheme ba based on that electron geometry. Let's look at the chloride ion first. So chlorine is the central atom in this molecule, and it has four electron groups on it. Two single bonds coming off of the chlorine and two lone pairs. I'm only counting the lone pairs on the chlorine. You never count the lone pairs on the outer or terminal atoms like these lone pairs on the oxygen here. So four electron groups on that chlorine, two single bonds and two lone pairs. That indicates a tetrahedral geometry. And associated with tetrahedral geometry, we always have an sp3 hybridization scheme. So chlorine in this case, its valence orbitals has, have actually hybridized to form four equivalent sp3 hybrid orbitals. Let's look at the SF4 molecule next. Sulfur actually has an expanded valence in this particular molecule. It has uh, four electron groups associated with four single bonds to the fluorine. And then uh, if you do the Lewis structure for this, you'll find that you have extra valence electrons. Those two extra valence electrons have to go on that central sulfur atom. And so we have five electron groups total, four bonds, one lone pair. That indicates a trigonal bipyramidal geometry and sp3d hybridization on the sulfur. 
Next, let's look at nitrite. Nitrite has three electron groups on it. A lone pair, a single bond, and a double bond. Remember that double and triple bonds are counted as one electron group total because they're shared just between two atoms. They're grouped together. So three electron groups on the nitrogen indicates trigonal planar geometry and sp2 hybridization. Now, once you know the hybridization scheme, you can also look at the single and double and triple bonds to determine the number of sigma and pi bonds in each molecule. So all single bonds indicate a sigma bond formed from head-on overlap. So that's the case for the single bonds in the chlorite ion, as well as those four single bonds in the SF4 molecule. Now the first bond in a double or triple bond is also always a sigma bond. So for the nitrite ion, we have two sigma bonds. The second bond in a double bond and the third bond in a triple bond as well are always pi bonds formed from side-by-side -side overlap. So the nitrite ion, because it does have a double bond, actually contains two sigma bonds and one pi bond overall. So in summary, according to valence bond theory, covalent bonds form when orbitals with unpaired electrons overlap. And sigma bonds form from head-on overlap of orbitals, pi bonds form from side-by-side -side overlap. In molecules with three or more atoms, the central atom forms hybrid orbitals from the combination of the atomic S, P, D, and F orbitals into new equivalent waveforms. And the number of hybrid orbitals formed depends on the geometry of the electron groups around the central atom, according to Vesper theory. Single bonds are always formed from sigma bond overlaps, while double and triple bonds are formed from both sigma and pi bond overlap.